Dale Carnegie was once asked how he got his knees to stop shaking while he was speaking in public. And Dale responded that he never did. He only learned how to keep speaking while his legs were shaking. And with that quote, Dale offers us one of the best tips on how to ignite change through public speaking. But I'm not here today to share with you another group of tips on how to be a great public speaker. Odds are you already have those lists. They're abundant, they're available. You might even have your own book on your bookshelf at home that's gonna tell you how to ignite change through public speaking. But for one reason or another, we decide to keep our messages to ourselves. We talk ourselves out of it. We say things like, you've either got it or you don't, and I don't got it. It was a God-given gift that he didn't give to me. Well, after a lot of life experience, I've learned that we all got it, all of us. It's just a matter of learning some basics, finding some people to help us, and then practice, practice, practice. Because if you don't practice, let me tell you about my very first public speaking experience. I was in fourth grade, and it was my charge to present an autobiography of Vincent Van Gogh. It was a school that went from kindergarten to fourth grade, so technically, I was the senior. I was to be an expert on the topic, and I intended to prove it. So as was part of the task, I first set out by dressing up as the famous painter. Some might seek to set the stage by maybe putting out a vase, putting in that vase 12 sunflowers, an iconic painting from Vincent van Gogh. I decided to be a little bit more unique. I got a big, thick sweater, and I covered my ear in gauze. <laughs> if half of my time was spent on wardrobe, the other half was spent writing out my note cards. And the day approached, and my mom said, Jonathan, do you think you should practice before this? I said, Mom, I've got my note cards. I will be all set. I've got a bad feeling about this. And the day came, and I discovered a whirlwind of new sensations. The first one, flop sweat. Only made worse by the thick, heavy sweater now constricting around me like a vice. The second one is what I call the darkness. Because as I stood up, my brain sat back down. <laughs> and I began, to I began to panic. And as I began to panic, I held up my note cards, doing a great job of blocking the microphone in front of me. I read as fast as I could, and the only time I slowed down was, was, my, was when my sweaty palms began to smudge the ink. The end of the speech came in an awkward sitting falling motion. I put myself back on the stage and announced up to the microphone, I died. <laughs> and from that moment on, I was never sure of the worst fate, to have my ear cut off, to get a, sh a gunshot wound, or have to speak in public again. Some of you may have a similar story that involves high hopes to center stage, nerves, and crushing embarrassment. So where do we go from there? For me, the change took place when I was in high school, and I worked at Restaurante La Fontana with Vic. And Vic told me two things. One, yo dude, you suck at busting tables. The second thing, a bit more constructive, yo dude, you're going to learn something from everyone that you will ever meet. And from that point on, I got better at busting tables, and I became a perpetual observer. And as a perpetual observer, I eventually got the chance to sit in the crowd with some of the big shots. I'm talking about the folks that can ignite change in grown men and women, galvanize them around great causes to do great things. And as I sat there, I started to think, what is it that they all have in common? Some, but not all, could sell ice to Eskimos. Some, but not all, have a memory like a herd of elephants. And some, but not all, are the most intelligent people that you will ever meet. The one thing I found that they all had in common was a sound ability to communicate. Not a unique ability to communicate, an amazing ability to communicate, just a sound ability to communicate. They knew that there were basics, some things that you just had to get under control to know what you were doing. Things like structure, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Body language how to use a quote or a question to pull your audience in or back in and grab their attention. They knew all those basics, and they realized that it's a competence. When you think about a competence, to stand out, sometimes you just need the basics. Like when my wife and I, before our wedding, decided that we learned, wanted to learn ballroom dancing. Since then, we've been fooling people at almost every wedding we go to that we know our way around the dance floor. But what happened? I learned how to count. One, two, three, four. Again, one, two, three, four. I learned how to be the sturdy frame for a beautiful flowing painting. My wife learned how to internalize her reaction when somebody steps on her foot repeatedly. <laughs> but when you put the basics together, along with a desire to have a really good time, we pop. It's public speaking works the same way. If you've got it in you to get that message, that message of change out of you, you just learn the basics and the rest falls into place. 
But the trick about the basics is you might think you have them, but there's things going on around you, I guarantee we all have them, I still doubt them, that you don't even know about. And that's where you need the help. For help, I went to Toastmasters, and that first day I met Greg. Greg told me about his icebreaker speech, and he told me about the ah counter, the person whose sole responsibility in that meeting would be to count the number of times I would say um or ah when I shouldn't have. Greg told me for his icebreaker speech, a speech so easy, all he had to do was get up in front of the crowd and talk about himself. He had 64 ums and ahs in under six minutes, and do you know how many Greg was aware of? Only about five. But over time, because he was getting feedback, he got better and better. And by the time he did that ninth speech, his capstone speech, he had no ums and ahs in over eight minutes. Greg went on to ignite his own change when he started his own Toastmasters Club and took on ever greater responsibility at his company. So now we know we've got the basics. We're going to have to get some help. But the third part that eluded me for the longest time, that seems so obvious, is the importance of practice. Think about it this way. If a week from now, we're going to play some basketball, and we've got to practice, are you going to go to the court, or are you going to take a note card, draw a picture of a basketball on that note card, sit down and visualize yourself shooting baskets, passing, dribbling, and winning the game? Obviously, you're going to go to the court. You're going to go to the court, you're going to practice, maybe bring somebody with you, maybe bring a coach, maybe practice by yourself. You do all that because you know that basketball is a skill. And with practice, you're going to get better. And you're going to be able to do a layup with some degree of confidence and have an impact. That's how public speaking works. But so often, again, we talk ourselves out of it. Now, I'm not saying this has happened to any of you in the audience. No TEDx or this has ever happened to you. But I'll use myself as an example. Where I've been on a group, maybe three, four people, and we've got a speech coming up. You think we should practice, guys? No, no. We don't, we, we've got this. We've got no cards. 20 years later, and we've still got no cards getting ready for our speech. And the big day comes. You're in the audience, and I'm up here, and here come the note cards. My team, meanwhile, they've probably got their set of note cards standing against the board, looking like they're waiting for the bus when it's their turn to speak. And I'm there reading my note cards, and you're in the audience, but where have you gone? The moment I start reading, that's your cue to take off mentally. You're running through the errands that you've got to take care of the moment I'm done talking to you. And what's happening there is you're missing what could be an important message because the medium is interrupted by my reliance upon note cards. Why? Because we talked ourselves out of it. We said things like, why would I sit or stand in front of the mirror and repeat to myself my own speech? Who does that? The person that does it is the person that realized that confidence lies on the other side of practice. That's who does it. I'm not talking about memorizing. Memorizing is only going to be slightly less numbing to your audience than memorizing your speech and reading it to them. I'm talking about knowing your material so well that you can worry about everything else that's going on around you. Your voice, your body language, the technology that they strap on your head moments before you go out on stage. Because if you're only ever worried about the next thing you're going to say, how are you going to notice that you're pacing? It's a huge problem for me. And like I said, you can get help, but then they point it out to you. But how do you stop it? How do you stop your legs? I've relied on you for so long, and you would betray me by taking me back and forth across the stage without my knowledge or approval. It's through practice. Through practice, you can break your old habits, you form new ones, and you gain the confidence that it takes to have an impact on an audience and ignite change. So public speaking, like any other skill, you learn some basics, you find somebody or a group of people that are willing to invest in your development, and then you practice, practice, practice. And it takes time. Trust me, it takes time. But also trust me, when you see the doors open before you, you realize that it's no longer a question of if you can ignite change. You then realize that it's just your choice how much change you want to make. 